Welcome to ISC 1057, Computational Thinking. I'm Professor Janet Peterson from the Department of Scientific Computing. We developed this course uh, a couple years ago and have been offering it for several semesters in the standard face-to-face -face format, but now we've decided to offer it online just for you. Okay, this course, uh, the good part about this course is that there are no prerequisites and so it's open to everyone, every major, every undecided student. And moreover, we have gotten this course uh, approved to satisfy one of the liberal studies, logical thinking or quantitative thinking requirements. Okay, so one thing I want you to learn from this course is what is computational thinking and why is it important. And here what I've shown you is a quote from a person who's at the forefront of trying to bring computational thinking into the curriculum, not just at the college level, but at K through 12. And to show you that a lot of the large techni technology corporations are behind this movement, uh, I wanted to point out that Microsoft has supported a center for just for computational thinking at Carnegie Mellon University, as well as Google has a large educational component and they've dedicated one area of their education to computational thinking. Okay, the first thing I want you to realize is that since you live in the computer age, it's changing our lives in a, in a daily manner. Okay, for example, when you uh, look at Netflix, they always have recommendations for you. There's music recommendations from other platforms. Uh, here in Florida, we're very interested in hurricane predictions. So uh, you've seen a lot of those paths of the hurricanes. And that all uses computer simulations to model this, which in turn uses computational thinking. Other uses of computational thinking include things like driverless cars. In your lifetime, you're going to be using driverless cars. Okay, so what this course tries to do is it tries to gain insight in how some of these algorithms or recipes that are used to program computers are changing our lives. And we feel that everyone should have some knowledge about how these, the ideas that make them work and, and why they work. Okay, what are some of the specific course objectives here? The first thing, of course, is we want you to know what computational thinking encompasses and what it really doesn't. So there's some misunderstandings in what computational thinking is. Okay, our interest is, is in uh, programming computers to solve some of the problems that are of interest to science and in science and in society. In computational thinking, there's not always one way to solve a problem. There's maybe 50 ways to solve a problem. So we have to decide, well, what's the best way or what are the advantages of this method or, or disadvantages of it so we can compare it. Now, one thing I want you to think about in this course is there's some tasks that you do every day which, when you think about it, seem to be impossible but we're going to show you how scientists and engineers have figured out to do that with a computer. Now, the other thing in the past, say the 1800s and, and part in the uh, first three quarters of the 1900s, science, everyone considered it as theory. For example, Einstein was a theorist who looked at the theory of relativity, and then there were experimentalists who built things and tried things out. For example, airplane wings used to be designed on pencil and paper, and then they were built, and then they were tested in a wind tunnel. Now what they're done is they're designed on a computer with computer simulations. Now one thing I want to point out about this course is uh, knowing a computer language is not a prerequisite to this course, nor will we teach a computer language. In all our descriptions of computer algorithms or recipes to solve a problem, 
what we will do is we will explain them in plain English and not use a particular programming language. Okay, so students like to know, okay, by the end of the course, you know, what am I going to get out of this course? Okay, so I sort of tried to encapsulate this by uh, writing down some questions that I thought you can think about and will be able to answer after the end of the, by the end of this course. Now, one of the first units we're going to look at is Google's project on uh, scanning in every book that's ever written and then creating a searchable database from this. Now, this is a pretty daunting task because they estimate that, this, that there's over 130 million books ever written for them to scan in. Okay? So, there's some problems with this because, well, first of all, there's copyright laws. Okay? So, not only is it a da daunting task to do 130 million books, but there's also legal ramifications. So, we want to look at that. Now, the next unit we're going to look at is on cryptography. Now, students always have fun with this unit because in the, we divide it into two parts. And in the classical cryptography, that is cryptography before we have computers around, this is how people encoded messages. There were uh, one general would send a message to uh, one of some of his men on what to do, and they wanted to make it secret. Okay, so we're going to learn some of the uh, ciphers or codes that they use and to see why, you know, how secret they are, or how secure they are, and what they can do. But once we got computers, things changed completely. Okay, so now when I place an order at Amazon or Zappos or wherever I'm buying something for, I enter my credit card information and I don't want anyone to know what my credit card number is. So now cryptography makes your secure information secret so that people don't, uh, aren't able to steal it. So we want to look at what's happening now when I enter my credit card information. Okay, as I said, there are different approaches to solving problems. And the most obvious is just a brute force, okay? Just plug ahead and do an exhaustive search or whatever I need to do to do it. So we want to know, is this the best approach or, and is it even feasible for some problems? Now, there's also people, science fiction movies made about computers taking over the world. Well, first of all, you're going to realize in this course, it's not computers, it's the algorithms that run or the software that run the computers. So what we want to know is can computer algorithms learn? And in fact, they can. That's how driverless cars are working. Okay? Now here's another question I want you to answer, and it, to me, is a very seemingly impossible task. And we do it every single day. Okay? If I'm searching for something in my browser, I type in the search words, and then what happens? In like a couple seconds, if you have a good internet connection, your search engine returns your responses uh, in uh, not only just all your responses, but they rank them. They, t they put the one first that they think is most valuable to you based on your search. But wait a minute, there's over 1.8 billion websites out there, and they're increasing every day. So how can a search engine possibly search that many websites and give you your results in a couple of seconds? I mean, it's impossible. But of course, they do it, so it's not impossible. So we want to know how that works. Okay, another thing that uh, computer algorithms are getting much better at is pattern recognition. For example, like facial recognition or fingerprint recognition. So if they have the fingerprints of a suspected, for example, terrorist, they want to compare that fingerprint to all the ones in a database. Well, I read that there's over 31 million of those, so how can they compare one fingerprint to 31 million and get your answer back? in a short amount of time? That seems impossible to me, but we're going to be able to answer that question after we look at pattern recognition. Now, what about your textbook for this course? 
We found this little paperback that's really nice. It goes through nine algorithms that are changing our lives. Now, we're not going to cover all nine of them, but we're going to cover several of them in here. Now, this book is very conversational in style, and the author wrote it to, uh, for, uh, so that anyone uh, can uh, understand what he's talking about and uses simple examples. So it's worth buying and looking at, and if you're careful with it, you could probably give it away as a gift to one of your parents or something afterwards. And it's cheap. Okay, let me talk just uh, briefly about what the various uh, topics are that we're going to cover here. The first topic is basically just an introduction to com computational thinking and what an algorithm is. Okay, and this is only one week. After a week, we're going to have a good feeling for what's going on in computational thinking. Then we're going to look at, start looking at several applications. And the first one is the one that I mentioned about uh, Google Books and trying to digitize all the text, not just taking a picture of every book, but creating a searchable database. Okay, and we'll spend a week on that. Uh, the third unit is, is the one that students, I think, like almost the best, and that's cryptography. And remember, we said that we would break that into classical cryptography, where we're going to be doing codes by hand, by pencil and paper mostly, and then the modern cryptography of how it works on the computer. Then another big unit that we have is machine learning. This is where our driverless cars come in and where pattern recognition comes in. The next unit, we're going to look briefly on what it takes to write a program to, to do some game. Now, we're going to choose a really simple game because I only have one week to, to work on this, and that's word ladders. But we're going to see even with a very simple game like that, it's, there's a lot of possibilities that we have to consider. One thing computers do well is sorting and searching. Now, this is important to us, for example, when they're searching databases you're for your medical records or for whatever it is, uh, we want to do that quickly, and computers can do that quickly. And the last unit we'll talk about is something about random numbers and the aptly named Monte Carlo after the city, which involves uh, gambling, for example. Okay, how did I set up this course? Everything is on Canvas, as you would expect, and I divided the course into modules. Okay, instead of making a module for each unit, I thought it would be better if I made a module for each week of the course, and I'll show you a sample one in just a minute. Okay, so what I do there is I, I enter all the information, that I, all the materials for that week in a sequential order. That way you can... You know, okay, in order to do the second item on that list, I better have done the first item in that list. And so I think that will help you navigate the course a little better. Uh, there are weekly quizzes, couple quizzes. Uh, there are three exams during the semester over the large units. And so those large units are uh, cryptography, uh, machine learning, and sorting and searching. All the exams are online, and they're open book and open notes. And then there'll be a final exam in the same format for this course. All assignments, whether they're quizzes or projects or other homework-type assignments, have a due date on them. There'll be a due date in the calendar, and I'll also try and send out announcements reminding you that the uh, due date is coming up. <coughs> Both myself and the online mentor will have virtual office hours. Here's a sample of one of our modules. <clears throat> and as you can see, there are going to be notes for you to read. There are going to be quizzes for you to take. And then, for example, there's a couple MP on this module, there are a couple of MP4, which are videos. Now, what I've seen from teaching for quite a few years is that if I read a slide for an example, I usually go too fast. It's much easier on some of the examples if I write it on the blackboard. Well, I can't do that here, so what will I do instead? So I use my iPad and I just, my Apple Pencil, and I work out the, uh, out, out the problem by hand, and then I go 
uh, in a slower manner, and it's easier for the students to follow. Okay, of course, there's a course syllabus on your uh, Canvas website, and I made a video where I go through the syllabus in detail. Now, in particular, I know that students are most interested in my grading policy and my late homework policy or late assignment policy. So I go through that in detail and explain it on that video. So be sure and watch that video. Uh, before I go on, the other thing I wanted to point out is to get this course to count for a liberal studies requirement, you have to make a C minus or better. Now, my experience in teaching this course is that students who do all the work and stay with the course have no trouble whatsoever meeting that requirement. In fact, most of them do A's and B's, okay? So, but just keep this in mind that if you want to get that credit, you have to have a C minus or better. Our modules are set up so that they begin on Monday morning. So let's just say 12.01 a.m. and they go through to midnight of Sunday. So everything has to be done by midnight of Sunday. I may suggest to you that you have like this quiz done by Friday, but the absolute deadline is Sunday midnight. Okay, now on online courses, I don't want you to feel like you're, you're isolated, even though most of the time you'll be doing the work in, in your room. Okay, I'm going to have discussion forums. Okay, for example, on the Google unit, I might post the question, uh, some historians believe that uh, before the Civil War, people said the United States are, and after the Civil War, people began to say the United States is. That is, they thought of the United States as one entity. So I might ask you to whether you support that or not, and why. So you would search a database and give some conclusions about that. Uh, or you could uh, post about an answer that some other student did. So there'll be that kind of discussion post. In addition, Canvas has the ability to divide you into groups. You'll be divided into groups of two for some projects where you only work with one other person and then in larger groups for maybe a larger uh, project. So I hope that I can keep you involved with other students in the course. And of course, there's always the chat format, form, forum. Now, because we're using Canvas, uh, sometimes students have difficulty with that. You can ask your online mentor, the graduate student that's assisting with this course, or if they're not able to answer that question, FSU has a good uh, support center where you can look at frequently answered questions. If that doesn't help, you can create a ticket to ask a question. And I should point out that FSU is committed to giving the same level of support to online classes that they do to, to the standard face-to-face -face format. Okay, now what should you do next? Well, the next thing on the module, uh, in addition to looking at the syllabus, is to watch this video. Now, I did this because it's a funny video. It's a video from a course at MIT, okay? And so what it does is it tries to bring about across the point how difficult it is to describe something in a very orderly and precise manner. So the job at hand in this video is explaining how to make a PB&J sandwich. So it's pretty funny, and I hope it brings across the point. Okay, and then after you watch that video, you proceed to the next section of notes on computational, what is computational thinking and algorithms. Okay, so I look forward to working with you this semester, and I hope you have a great time and learn a lot.